At the outbreak of the Second World War, Britain had no special forces. That was soon to change. First came the Army Commandos, and then the Airborne Forces. Many resented the creation of such organizations, as they drew on the scarce resources and the better quality manpower available. However, Winston Churchill was convinced of the potential of such organizations, not only because of the damage they may inflict, but also because the British people were desperate to see him strike back. Captain David Sterling unwittingly was about to create one of the most dynamic and successful fighting units ever. Sterling, bypassing the normal channels of bureaucracy, sneaked into GHQ and placed his proposal on leadership's desk. The SAS was born. Sterling was instructed to recruit four officers and 60 men into a unit known as the Detachment of Special Air Service Brigade. At the time, no Special Air Service existed, but the title had been chosen to convince the enemy that a large formation did exist. Most of the volunteers came from No. 8 Army Commando, known as Lay Forces. Sterling's regiment recently disbanded. Among the first two officers were two who would simply become legends. Lieutenant Jock Lewis of the Welsh Guards and Lieutenant Paddy Main, an ex-Irish rugby international star and soldier who had quickly gained the respect of all ranks. The first intake of non-commissioned ranks included legends Bob Bennett and Johnny Cooper. The early days were hard. The British Army was short of everything, so the fledgling unit had to steal or hijack many of the things that were needed. We all rolled along to uh, Cabrit, which was a point on the canal that was picked as a campsite, and we were on three-ton trucks. We stopped. And there was absolutely nothing, no, no camp, nothing. And uh, David Stern had said, well, this is it. But he said, your first operation is going to be to steal a camp. And that night we went, we drove down about two miles to a, a Kiwi camp. And the Kiwis had gone up the blue, as we called it, up the desert. So the place was empty. And uh, we took everything we wanted. We nicked, I think it was about 14, 160 pounder tents. Um, and we also took a, a piano. We thought it might come in handy, but I don't think we ever found anybody that could play it. The initial training was also selection to weed out those whose motivation may not have been what was required. Most emphasis was placed on physical fitness and stamina. Also from an early stage, flawless weapons handling was considered absolutely vital Due to the lack of any parachute instructors, Jack Lewis became the chief instructor of the parachute training. We had these big stands that we used to jump off of and roll. Uh, and we had a, a little truck on a railway that where people two would get on and, and the rest would push the truck and then you jump off into the sand. And then the crazy thing came up that would be 1,500 weight trucks and that you'd face the rear, and he'd do about 30 mile an hour, and you'd just leap off. And there were so many accidents and, and breaks and sprains that that stopped on, on the dock. Things did not go well. The only aircraft available was an outdated Bristol Bombay that wasn't properly modified. The first training jump we did from Cabret, planes flew over the canal and started dropping. Well, I was standing with a chap, a great friend of mine, a chap named Kershaw, and we saw somebody come out, but we didn't see a parachute. First jump, we went on. The uh, first two, they crashed. Sterling immediately stopped the training, ascertained the problem, and devised a solution. His leadership was instinctive. The next morning, he was the first one out of the aircraft. The momentum was gathering. Their first operation came in November 1941. So the decision was to take our Lewis bombs, which Lewis designed, to parachute and go into the two main airfields and blow up as many aircraft as we could. By the time we jumped, it was an absolute blizzard. It was, it was like a hurricane. The SAS baptism could not have been worse. Of the 65 men who jumped, only 22 returned, and no German aircraft were destroyed or attacked. 
a lot of us were dragged away and couldn't get together, but I was very lucky. I was with Jock Lewis and we all got together. We were the only complete stick out of the 22 that came back. In December, the next raid was mounted. Again, the task was to destroy aircraft on the ground. The raiders were transported to airfields on the coast. The concept was taking hold. Sterling was authorized to recruit more men, as well as introducing a group of 53 French parachuters. We got up, into, dropped into Wadi Tamit. We saw planes take off fly for a short distance and drop down again, obviously landing. And we marched, marched and marched until everybody was absolutely browned off and they was going to turn back. But I hate the smell of high octane petrol and I could smell this. And we then we came to what was the bomb dump and stuff like that. And if I remember correctly, we put one or two bombs on that. I went down into the bomb dump that's underground, screwed the caps off, one or two of the big bombs there, and stuffed a bomb in it. And we came out and we came across the buildings. And this is when Paddy, without any warning really, just went in, booted the door open, and they opened up. And then we carried on. We'd spotted the aircraft, and we carried on putting the bombs on. And we ran out of bombs, and we started to... Uh, destroy the uh, panels. And we came to a CR-42, and that's when Paddy ripped the uh, control panel completely out of it. And that gives you an idea of the strength of the man, because it takes a lot of wires, electric wires and whatnot, not that tough, but he ripped the bloody lot out. Never idle, Sterling was constantly looking to enhance the fighting potential of the SAS. In the case of the Willys Jeep, it was simply love at first sight. The necessary strings were pulled, and the metamorphosis began. The Jeeps allowed the SAS to adopt new tactics for airfield raiding. No longer would they take the risk of planting explosive charges on the stationed aircraft. David Stone around said to me, he said, um, we hit the airfield, and the lights came on, and the, an aircraft came into land, and we could see the whole of the airfield lit up with maybe 60-odd aircraft on the ground and so we drove straight on down in column firing on both sides then we turned round came back firing on the other side but we only we only lost one man killed Rama wrote in his diary they caused considerable havoc and seriously disquieted the Italians Hitler agreed ordering the captured SAS should be handed over to the Gestapo for execution these men are dangerous. They should be hunted down at all costs. 